Well, that was fun. We can take callers now. Let's, I know a lot of folks are anxious. Yes, we have a number of people that have uh, been on the line for a while. We'll start with David in Columbus, Ohio. David? Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Wonderful. Fun talk about the uh, prosperity gospel. Unfortunately, I know nothing about that and uh, didn't call in to talk about that. That's all okay, right. That's what fine. do you got for us? Um, so there's a William Lane Craig is one of the big time heavyweight champion apologists who's going to be coming to a univer university soon. Who is it? William Lane Craig. Oh, uh -huh. coming to Columbus. Yeah. 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 So um, this has kind of sparked a lot of uh, conversation and stuff going on between a lot of people. And one thing that I've heard while talking to people is that, um, at least from a Christian's perspective, it's unfortunate that there's no extra biblical evidence for Jesus. You guys. That's that's if you can if you can find Christians that will admit to that. It's not unfortunate um, for those who are going to just you know hand wave and give you a list of supposed sources that uh, in fact are no good if you look at them, but they believe they're good. Right. I'm kind of talking. You know, uh, a lot of atheists have said that there aren't, there's no extra biblical evidence yeah. for Jesus. That's that, correct. That is correct. So this seems to be kind of an unfair point to me because. The Bible and the New Testament specifically was, it's the amalgamation of information about Jesus. It's not like it's one single data point. It's, this is, this is a collection of information that was about Jesus at the time. You know, treating, treating the New Testament like, like it's a single source. So if is, there had been like some, you know, arrest record or, or a Roman document about this Jesus guy and what a troublemaker he was and we gotta do stuff to him, you think that would have made it into the Bible if they'd found it? Um, that doesn't seem very likely to me. Yeah, probably not, but in, 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 that kind of, that's kind of beyond the point. It's, it's, I'm saying that it's, it's not a single... You, you don't think it's odd that, uh, that this guy's doing miracles and raising the dead and doing all these things and, and nobody bothered to, to lift a pen and write about it? Well, no, what he's saying is what he's, yeah, what he's what he's saying is, and that's a that's a reasonable question, right? The the Bible is a collection of multiple documents, so why doesn't that count, right? Mm -hmm. As it, it, the books that were left out would be extra biblical sources. That, that's you know that's a good thing you could look at, right? What about the books that didn't make it, right? Like right, the like one, the, what's the crazy Judas gospel that... Oh, the gospel of Judas, that's a great one. Says I like that, that one. Says that it was suicide Jesus by cop. is some alien from a planet? No, 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 no. Is that the gospel the of Judas is where, uh, where Judas is the hero, and Jesus is saying, um, hey, you know, I need you to help me shed these clothes. Will you do this for me? Uh -huh. and meaning, meaning his body, right? Uh -huh. so, so it's really, uh, as, I, as I said, a suicide by cop where... Where Judas is turning Jesus in so that he can be killed, yeah. and and that Jesus, as Judas is kind of the hero in the, the I, particular I think, one. I think the point though about about uh, the lack of extra biblical sources, it's not probably the it would be worth um, mentioning that the the wording of that is not the best. The point is there's no sources outside the 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 uh, group of believers. It's only believers who appear to have written about Jesus. And when I say believers, I mean followers, right? That's a good point. You don't, yeah. you don't, you don't hear about, oh, I'm some traveler from Syria, and uh, I th thought it was all very crazy, but th there was this big crowd gathered, and there was this Jesus guy, and he was, they were saying he was doing miracles. There's none of that. The only people, apparently, who ever wrote about him were people who were already in the religion and already believed. That's the problem. Well, I wouldn't expect anyone else to write about it. I mean, that's... Really? Because nobody writes about anything that they saw unless they're a worshiper of it. That if, doesn't follow. If someone saw the, the miracles being, being performed by Jesus, I think they would become a believer. That would be... I, well, I'm not even talking... I just mentioned a, uh, you know, some traveler, some foreign traveler who didn't see the miracles but just heard about them. There's no examples of contemporaries who just heard about Jesus and mentioned him. None. That's the problem. Well, those people, the documents they wrote, I don't think there'd be any reason to save those. I mean... To do what? To, to, to save them? I'm sure they were... It, things like that may exist, but and it's not like we have every single document ever written <laughs> from every single... You're right. There could be history. sealed away somewhere where nobody has ever seen it for 2,000 years. There could be saying, the proof. No, but until you find the proof, no it's not proof. It doesn't it, count it's if it hasn't been found.
What's that? I mean, there's no reason to think that we would still have that. It's not like it's sealed away somewhere in some secret safe. I think that, you know, <laughs> it just won't last forever. Hey, dude, you know... Um, that we have all kinds of ancient documents about all kinds of things. If Jesus was, in fact, the big deal he's supposed to have been at the time, there would have been people who heard about that and wrote it down other than folks who were already in the cult. There would have. So the, the fact that doesn't exist is a big red flag. Uh, I don't know. Okay. I, well, I, I completely understand your point. Yeah, but I don't know. I'm. I guess I need more time to think about this and process it through. But all right. All right. Thanks again. Or yeah, thanks for calling. Thanks, thanks, David. I guess you didn't have anything. That's for fine. David. Thank you, David. Um, do I make him go away? I think away? he hit drop. Okay, we're going on to our next part. Uh, the resurrection of Christ. Jesus died on a cross. Uh, historical evidence is Tacitus, Roman historian, AD 55 to 120. Uh, Christus, i.e. Christ, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of our pure creator Pontius Pilate. So there's a Roman historian uh, who testifies to Jesus dying on a cross. Other historians and historical evidence is Lucian, the Greek satirist, uh, Mara Barra Sepion, AD 70, and Flavius Josephus, 38 to 97 AD. All these are Sources outside the Bible near the time of Jesus' life, not far away from his life, where they testify about Jesus and who he was and him dying on the cross. Now, this evidence is so strong that even a skeptic like Dominic Crossan of the Jesus Seminar and Marcus Borg have said that Jesus was crucified is as sure as any fact in the ancient world. Uh, so when it says and it was the third hour and they crucified in Mark chapter 15 25 Luke 23 verse 46 Matthew 27 35 uh, it's confirmed by these sources outside the Bible Hi right, folks we're looking at uh, Dr. Falcom's book uh, Jesus and the Eyewitness uh, the Gospels as Eyewitness text Domini Richard Balkum 2006 Erdman and we're on page five now. He says it is true that, that a powerful trend in modern development of critical historical philosophy and methods finds trusting testimony a stumbling block in the way of the historian's autonomous access to that she or he can verify independently. But it is also rather neglected fact that all history, like all knowledge, relies on testimony. Page five. Yeah, there's been a, a double standard within scholarship, I think. Um, and I think that the theory of understanding history needs to change within the academic world uh, when it comes to historical Jesus studies. Um, we'll just deconstruct this. It is true that a powerful trend in modern development of critical historical philosophy and method finds trust in the testimony a stumbling block in the way of historians autonomous access to the to to truth that she or he can verify independently now it's interesting that ancient historians which we'll get into uh, had great store in in eyewitness material uh, also there has been a trend uh, between uh, macro and micro understanding of history you see there's been a big emphasis all over for a, a long time since rank uh, historian uh, on macro history that is looking at history on a on a big big compartment uh, looking at history from uh, general perspectives or politicians perspectives but there's also uh, since the 60s been more of an emphasis on a micro level of understanding of history and that is to say that um, we look at what ordinary people are thinking what what are they saying and we take their material their eyewitness material their stories their diaries so what I'm saying is that 
maybe this reluctance on modern historiography of not wanting to take eyewitness material seriously is because it's been saddled with this kind of macro understanding of history without realizing the need to listen to the testimonies of individuals and to learn from what those are saying. I understand that historians study diaries and letters and, and all the rest of it. But why is it that we don't allow that kind of historical work inform us about the historical Jesus studies? Why are we prejudiced? Maybe it's because there's been a running battle for the last 200 years between secularism and, and church and there's been a vine of power of wanting to control public space part of that is to undermine Christianity's intellectual foundations and one of those is the Gospels and the New Testament is based on eyewitness material and so to disparage that would also to undermine Christianity but I think as academics you need to come back and realize that this is not acceptable that you you're not here to play power games you're here to inst uh, to do historical study uh, in a more fair way as in the best and fair way that you can and then he says that always that rather but it is also rather neglected fact that all history like all knowledge relies on testimony and so therefore there's the rub that we can't just ignore the fact that if we're going to do history it's ultimately based on testimony we've got to be consistent where does that leave us in terms of Christianity well I think Borker's project is saying what we, we've got to get back to a fair practice of history and a serious commitment to seeing what eyewitness material there is and what we can learn from that material. Hi there folks, this is Jason, hope you're okay today, it's good to see you and uh, love to everybody out there. I'm just going to be thinking about um, was Jesus a, a real historical figure and uh, we've been discussing with some of the atheists on YouTube and um, every fact that's been brought to them they've kind of dis tried to dispute it but you know facts are facts and it's no good trying to dispute with facts and that's what I'm finding with quite a few of you atheists out there when you're presented with facts you do try to like to dodge it so let's just read a few more facts this is page 121 on um, on this book uh, Joshua McDowell evidence that demands a verdict and it says uh, on the historical historicity of Jesus. Lucian of Samosta, Greek satirist of the later half of the second century, Lucian spoke scornfully of Christ and the Christians, never assuming or arguing that they were unreal. As Lucian said, the Christians, you know, worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. You see, these misguided creatures started with the general conviction that the immoral for all time which explains the contempt of death and voluntary self-devotion which are so common among them and then it was impressed on them by their original lawgiver that they are all brothers for the moment that they are converted and deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage and, have, and live after his laws all this they take quite on faith with the result that they despise all worldly goods alike regarding them merely on common property Lucian the death of per Peregrine so what do you think of, of Lucian there there's some more historical information are you going to twist it atheist are you going to try and run round and try and deny that Christ existed try to say that he was a myth it says uh, Sutinius uh, or Sotanius another Roman historian court official under Hadrian an analyst, analyst of the imperial house stated in his life of Claudius as the Jew 
<laughs> yeah, I know what you're laughing at. I'm laughing at it as well. As the Jews were making constant disturbances at the investigation of Crestus, another spelling of Christus, he, Claudius, expelled them from Rome. Luke refers to this event in Acts 18 uh, verse 2, which took place in AD 49. In another work, Sotus or Sutus wrote about the fire that swept through Rome in AD 64 under the siege of Nero. Sotus or Sutus recounts the punishment by Nero was inflicted on the Christians, a class of men given to a new and mischievous superstition. Assuming Jesus was crucified in the early 30s, Sustinius, no friend of Christianity, places Christians in the imperial city less than 20 years later and he reports that they were suffering and dying for the conviction that Jesus Christ had really lived, died and risen from the dead. So what do you think of that piece of evidence, atheist? Then we look at uh, Pliny the Younger, governor of Bithynia in Asia Minor, AD 112. Pliny was writing uh, the Emperor Trajan to seek counsel as to how to treat the Christians. He explained that he had been killing both men and women, boys and girls, and there were so many being put to death that he wondered if he would continue killing anyone who was discovered to be a Christian or if he should kill only certain ones. He explained that he had made the Christians bow down to the statues of Trajan. Pliny goes on to say that he also made them curse Christ, which a genuine Christian cannot be induced to do. In the same letter he says of the people being tried, they affirmed, however, that the whole of their guilt all the error was that they were in the habit of meeting on a certain day before it was light, which they sang in alternate verse a hymn of Christ as to God, and bound themselves to a solemn oath not to do any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, adultery, never to falsify their word, not to deny trust when they should be called upon to deliver it. So that's another piece of evidence. F.F. Bruce, check out F.F. Bruce, atheist, Google F.F. Bruce. I mean, here is a top world-class scholar. He was at Manchester uh, University. He's passed away now a few years ago. But top world-class uh, scholar says this, The gospel account of the darkness which fell upon the land during Christ's crucifixion, crucifixion was well known and required a naturalistic explanation from non-Christians. Thallus did, no doubt that Je did not doubt that Jesus had been crucified and that an annual event had occurred in nature that required an explanation. What occupied his mind was coming up with a different interpretation. The basic facts were not called into question. So the basic facts of who Christ was in history was not questioned even by uh, those early Roman historians and writers. Another example, uh, Thallus, one of the first secular writers who mentioned Christ is Thallus, dated perhaps around AD 52, Thallus wrote a history of the eastern Mediterranean world from the Trojan War to his own. Unfortunately, his writings now exist only in fragments that have been cited by other writers. One such writer is Julius Africanus, a Christian who penned his work around AD 221. One very interesting passage relates to a comment by Thallus about the darkness that evoked the land during the late afternoon, late afternoon hours when Jesus died on the cross. As Africanus reports, Thallus, in the third book of his histories, explains away this darkness as an eclipse of the sun, unreasonably, as it seems to me, unreasonably, of course, because a solar eclipse could not take place at the time of the full moon, and it was at the season of the Paschal full moon that Christ died. Julius Africanus, Chronography 8.1 This reference shows that the gospel account of the darkness fell upon the land during Christ's crucifixion, was well known and required a naturalistic explanation from the non-Christians. Thallus did not doubt that Jesus had been crucified and that an annual event had occurred in nature that required an explanation. What occupied his mind was the task of coming up with a different interpretation. The basic facts were not called into question. It's getting pretty, pretty bad for you, atheists. You've got to admit the historicity of Jesus Christ. Do you admit, atheists, that Jesus Christ was a historical figure or not because the facts are quite clearly demonstrating that is the case. Next one is uh, Phaegon or F-P-H-I-E-G-O-N uh, I'm a bit dyslexic so that's why um, 
sorry, it's P L E G O N, uh, Flagon. Another secular authority, Flagon, wrote a history called Chronicles. While this work had been lost, Julius Africanus preserved a small fragment of it in his writings. Like Thallus, Phalagon confirms that darkness came upon the earth at Jesus' crucifixion, and he too explains it as the result of a scholar eclipse. During the time of the Tiberius Caesar, an eclipse of the sun occurred during the full moon. Africanus chronography. Aside from Africanus, Phlegon's reference to this event is also mentioned by the 3rd century Christian apologist Origen and the 6th century writer uh, Philippon. So what do you think of uh, Phlegon? I'll write these names down for you and give you some articles that you can go and read. So that's another piece of information, atheist. What do you think of that? And then finally, uh, Mara Bar uh, Saprion, Sarapion. Sometime after AD 70, Mara Bar Serapion, a Syrian and probably Stoic philosopher, wrote a letter from prison to his son, encountering him to pursue wisdom. In his letter he compares Jesus to the philosophers Socrates and Pythagoras. He writes, What advantage did the Athenians gain from putting Socrates to death? Famine plague came upon them and a judgment from their crime. What advantage did the men of Samos gain from burning Pythagoras? In a moment their land was covered with sand. What advantage did the Jews gain from executing their wise king? It was just after that their kingdom was abolished. God justly avenged these three wise men. The Athenians died of hunger. The Samians were overwhelmed by the sea and the Jews ruined and driven from their land, living complete dispersion. But Socrates did not die for good. He lived on his teaching for Plato. And Pythagoras did not die for good. He lived in the nature of, of Hera. Nor did the wise king die for good. He lived on in the teaching which he had given. This father was certainly not a Christian since he puts Jesus on equal footing with Socrates and Protagoras. He has Jesus living on his teaching rather than in his resurrection and in another place he indicates a belief in polytheism. Nonetheless his references to Christ indicate that he did not question whether Jesus lived or not. I think that's quite clear uh, quite clear and very very well it's just indisputable and strong evidence to say that uh, to, to, to establish that the historicity of Christ and I think for you atheists out there to deny that and to say that Christ was a mythological figure to me and I think to most reasonable people it's just not fair so what do you think atheists let us know take care and God bless you okay we're looking at Jesus and the eyewitnesses uh, Gospels as Eyewitness Testimony, Richard Ball from 2006, published by Erdman. We're on page 7. He writes uh, concerning Vincent Taylor, Borkham says he went on to point out that the eyewitness participants in the events of the Gospel narratives did not go into permanent retreat for at least a generation. They moved among the young Palestinian communities and through the preaching of fellowship the re their reconstructions were at the disposal of those who sought information. So what Borkham is saying, quoting Vincent Taylor, a scholar, is that actually these key important people like Peter and James and people like that, they didn't just disappear off the scene uh, straight away they were preaching and they were passing on the beliefs to other people and if this is the case there will be a strong historical core about Jesus that is reliable within that participation he quotes Martin Hengel I personally think of the Jesus tradition with particular um, I can't read that word um, I personally think of the Jesus tradition uh, or more precisely the memory and missionary preaching uh, as historically undeniable 
that's Martin Hengel he quotes what what he's saying is that you can't get away from the fact that if you say that Jesus didn't rise from the dead Jesus didn't exist whatever you can't get away from the fact that it's undeniable that the early tradition of Jesus that they actually believed that he did rise from the dead that they, be they believed in the, the historical uh, the miracles and all the rest of Jesus mission they believed that and that's what they were preaching that can't be denied so someone said well they, uh, they, they saw a, a, an imaginary Jesus they saw imaginary miracles the point is that they didn't say that they said they saw Jesus do miracles they said they saw Jesus rise from the dead that's the fact that we have to deal with and that's what Balcom is saying if we get to the eyewitness material once we start to take that seriously then we've got to deal with that fact those facts The word trident, that's the word, yeah. Martin Gengel, I personally think of the Jesus tradition with particular trident, or more precisely their, me their memory and missionary preaching is historically undeniable. The word trident uh, means the person who delivers or handles, hands over uh, any property to another. So they're the people who are handing over, in this particular case, the story of Jesus. Um, now we'll leave it at that and we'll get on to another this video. is Jay, hope you're okay today, it's good to see you we're looking at the historicity of the book of Acts and um, uh, we'll just listen to Dr. Keener for a second uh, a professor and then world authority on the book of Acts we know of ancient novelists these are the kinds of things that we would find instead in the work of ancient historiography um, one one uh, work that actually deals with these correspondences with external history has over a hundred pages of this kind of material. Paul's letters are a major source of external corroboration for the Book of Acts. You know, you have some differences because you know Luke is not Paul, but you have so many correspondences. For example. Uh, the names in Paul's circle, not only major characters, like of course Peter and, and so on, but also an, a wide range of minor characters. Uh, the role of Barnabas fits, the role of Silas fits, the role of Timothy fits. Uh, and um, we have more, f more, uh, eight, more than 84 facts, historical facts in the book of Acts that have been verified by a historian who is not trying to follow Christianity but just being honest about studying the text the facts that we found out are the place of a conspicuous sailor's landmark uh, Soma Thrace, uh, Acts 12.14 the proper description of Philippi as a Roman colony Acts 16.12 the right location for, for the river Gangites near Philippi <coughs> Acts 12.13 uh, 13 the proper association of Thyatira as a center for dying Acts 16 14 number 4 correct designation 14 correct designation for the magistrates of the colony uh, 16 22 15 the proper location of uh, Amphilopolis and Apollonia where travelers would spend successive nights on this journey <coughs> Acts 17 1 um, number 16 the presence of a synagogue in Thessalonica Acts 17.1 <coughs> 17 the proper terms polytarchs used for the magistrates there 17.6 Acts 17.6 number 18 the correct implication that sea travel is the most convenient way of reaching Athens with a favouring east wind of summer sailing Acts 17.14.15 number 19 the abundant presence of images in Athens Acts 17.16 <coughs> number 20 the reference to synagogue in Athens Acts 17.17 Number 21, the depiction of the Athenian life, a philosophical debate in the Agora, Acts 1717. 17. Number 22, the use of correct Athenian slang word for Paul in Spermologos in Acts 1718. 
as well as for the court Arios and Pagos, 70, Acts 17.19. So we'll do one more video, <coughs> and that gives you an indication that there are many, many facts, historical facts in the book of Acts that you can read and research and know that the book is history. Hi folks, this is Jay. Hope you're okay today. It's good to see you. We're looking at Gary Habermas's PhD and minimal a fact approach to the resurrection. The PhD is a defense of the resurrection. We've just been looking at Hume's scholarship with a few uh, thoughts from C.S. Lewis as well. I'm going to listen to Gary Habermas talk about the minimal fact approach and then we'll move into some thoughts on the on his PhD and then move into uh, reflections on what we've read and heard. Eyewitness data. You have to rhyme things for, I, I teach exclusively uh, PhD students and for PhD students, required books go by colors. So you take out your orange book, that's what we do in grad school. And then we talk about alliteration because it's easier for grad students to remember things. We don't do this with undergrads because they don't remember whether you do it or not. But with grad students, I say the two E's, okay? Early and eyewitness, just like the George Washington question. We want people who are there, and we want people who are in the right place. You say, well, eyewitnesses could be wrong. Yes, they are, but what are you going to do? Cite nine, eye nine eyewitnesses because eyewitnesses could be mistaken? No, we still use eyewitnesses. And we want them to be people who are in the right time, right place, asking the right questions, and so on. And it's real helpful if they're enemies, it's real helpful if they change their view, it's real quite uh, helpful if there's checks and balances, and so on. That's how we do history. All right, on my little timeline here, that's going to be creation down there. This is the cross. Scholars usually say 30 AD, but you'd be surprised how seldom they answer that question. Uh, probably the second most popular date is 33. I'm just going to say ground zero, give or take. It's about 30 AD. Down there is 2011. Now, before I do minimal facts, let me give you a typical way that somebody, I'm going to have to be real sketchy, but when somebody says the New Testament's at least a historically trustworthy book, let me talk about how they're going to do that. If you say, well, how do I know the resurrection happened? On this timeline, I'm going to say, well, one very common on the reliability argument response is going to say, well, the book of Mark is written, and I'm going to use skeptical dates, okay, so you can see it's not that huge an issue. Uh, the book of Mark is written about 70 AD. We're only plus 40. You have to study ancient history to know how good plus 40 is. It's just, it, it's great, great time period. Okay, using critics' dates, Matthew, about 10 years later, at plus 80. Luke, about five years later, at about plus 85. Acts, plus 85, plus 90, something like that. Everybody, conservatives and liberals, puts John at about 95 AD. So my point is that if the, the worst it gets is we're about plus 65 to John. Now, critics often deal with sort of a double standard when they deal with the New Testament. And they're going to say, yeah, 95 AD, Matthew, uh, 50, Luke, 55. Isn't that getting a little bit late? Well, when they ask questions like that, they're either, they either, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean, but either they haven't studied a lot of ancient history or they're not familiar with sources or they're just being overly critical of the New Testament or whatever. Because if I said, all right, forget Jesus for right now. Let's say ground zero is the death of Alexander the Great. What are our best sources for Alexander the Great? What are the best sources? Well, there were several people who wrote during Alexander the Great's life, but we don't have any of those sources. We don't have any of them. They'd be very valuable. We don't have any of them. The sources we have for Alexander are, and I'm gonna, I'd have to keep walking way out past this window because the best sources for Alexander date 300 to 450 years after his death, about 330 BC. The two best sources are Arian and Plutarch, but they're also the latest sources. They're about plus 425 to 450 AD. That's a long time. You go, okay, fine, I get your point. Maybe Alexander's not the best example. Uh, we have better examples than that. Yes, we do. But I'm just using Alexander because he's such a prominent source. Well, how about somebody who's better data and closer to Jesus' time? Okay? How about Tiberius Caesar? He is the 
the Caesar who's on the throne when Jesus dies dies just a few years after Jesus dies. We have four major sources for Tiberius and a total of about ten sources for Tiberius. We have more than ten sources for Jesus. And you go, yeah, but that's those prejudiced New Testament sources. Okay, more about that in a second. Uh, use the way critics use. We still have more than ten sources for Jesus. Do you know we have a dozen and a half sources outside the New Testament for Jesus? A dozen and a half sources outside the New Testament that are within 100 to 150 years after Jesus, which is fair in the ancient world. And not, now when I say 100 to 150, you realize that John's a lot closer than this. But back to Tiberius. We have four sources for Tiberius. One is contemporary. Whoa. We don't have anything like that for Jesus. But as I'm going to argue tonight, we do. We have sources... And so I'm going to spend the rest of my time explaining that go all the way back to 30 AD for Jesus. Okay, so next best source. By the way, the earliest one for Tiberius, the, the historian who, who gives the contemporary data, he's the least useful. The least useful of the four sources. The best source for Tiberius is Tacitus. And Tacitus, if that's Tiberius down there, ground zero, Tacitus we'd probably be two-thirds of the way up the pews here. Because Tacitus writes, sorry, that's the last guy. Tacitus is going to, that's John, Tacitus is going to be out here. Tacitus writes about 120 A.D. He's plus 80 after Tiberius. Suetonius, plus 85. And Dio Cassius, two-thirds of the way up or further. Dio Cassius is plus 180 from Tiberius. So, well, okay, I see where you're going, but I have the ultimate objection for you. Gospels record miracles of Jesus. That disqualifies them. Really? Well, Greco-Roman, we'd say in English, files. It's not pronounced that way in Greek, but Greco-Roman files. It's a genre of biography, Greco-Roman biography, the, the most uh, reputable writing in the ancient world. We have, say, the father of history, so-called Herodotus, all the way through such names as Thucydides and all the way up to Livy and uh, Julius Caesar himself, and I already gave you some names, uh, plenty, but we also have Tacitus, Suetonius, Dio Cassius, and so on. These, these guys write bios and almost every Greco-Roman source includes miracles, prophecies, portents. Livy, probably second only to, Tiber uh, to Tacitus for his reputation as a Roman historian, uh, Livy records the founding of Rome by Romulus and Remus, the boys who were raised by a wolf, hundreds of years before his earliest source. He was obviously false. But we do doctoral dissertations on this material, and it's fair to use this, this material and start. You go, well, I don't trust any of it if there's miracles. Or if there's miracles in Greco-Roman sources, is not a rival for Christian miracles. So you've got to ask the question of which miracles are, are evidenced. And I'll just say this to be provocative, and then I'm going to have to move on to my minimal facts deal. Um, almost every skeptic, skeptical scholar, not the fly-by-night guys that don't work in the field that just take shots at Christianity. But skeptical scholars, I don't care how liberal they are, how far the left, virtually everybody today believes that Jesus was a miracle worker. Now, they're going to differ on how supernatural these things were and everything else. That's another question. But it's almost unanimous today. Among even Jesus seminar people, they'll call Jesus a miracle worker and an exorcist. In fact... Two of the best books that are out on this subject are each almost 500 pages. Sorry, nearly falling asleep there. So that's Gary Habermas explaining more of his minimal fact approach. Basically, what he's going to say is you're looking at the dates of the spectrum of the text from the, the Gospels from 60 to 70, 80, maybe 90 AD, depending whether you're conservative or in the middle. Um, but what he's going to say is the Paul's epistles specifically 1 Corinthians 15 goes right back to 33 or 32 AD 
and gives you historical information about Jesus and you can use that then to give a case for Jesus resurrection um, what we've just looked at in Gary Habermas's PhD is that um, is that uniformity of nature does not preclude the possibility of miracles if it did you would need to know all the miracle claims that have been made and to debunk them and that's not been done when a criteria when you have a criteria for investigating miracles as Hume did it actually proved to him that miracles do take place but he still didn't believe page 102 the human testimony uh, favor of these occurrences is impressive especially in view of the fact that it concerns claims of supernatural events um, that's Habermas Swinburne, Swinburne writes um, Habermas is quoting Swinburne no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the, f than, than the facts which endeavours to establish is always rejecting the greater miracle sorry about that no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous I think that's uh, David Hume um, I would disagree I think that it's basically just you're looking at history and you're just using historical methods and if the historical methods are pointed to the fact that an event took place that seems to be supernatural then so be it you don't have to have greater evidence to outweigh the uniformity of experience you just have to have evidence simple as that uh, Habermas says the fact is that we only know a small part of nature and cannot be sure that what we do know will continue to be the same in the future in other words this so called uniformity of nature that the way things are we don't see any dead people rise is only our small understanding of the natural natural world uh, he quotes uh, C.S. Lewis I think the whole idea of probability as Hume understood it depends on the principle of uniformity of nature we observe many regularities in nature but of course all the observations that men have made or will make whole um, cover only a minute fraction of the events that actually go on our observation would therefore be nonetheless non useless sorry the whole idea of probability as Hume understood it depends on the principle of uniformity of nature we observe many regularities in nature but of course all the observations that men have made or will make only covers a minute fraction of the events that actually go on also um, Harry Bermas notes that we can't prove the uh, uniformity of nature and that I think that Luke uh, that you actually agreed with that in his uh, writings he um, Habermas notes that David Strauss was heavily influenced by David Hume uh, Schleiermacher was of the opinion that miracles suspend the laws of nature Bruno Barr strong, um, strongly says that we could not have miracles um, coming to, you, to nature Ernest Rayner said that Jesus did not know the laws of nature Adolf Harnack said they were ancient ways of thinking Paul Tillich said 
Miracles can't interfere with the laws of nature. So, so Habermas uh, deals with um, lots of scholars in the old, uh, in the past and in the present on this issue of uniformity of nature, which is significant. If we're saying Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, we have to challenge this idea that because nature doesn't show any miracles they don't happen we c it can be challenged philosophically 